Let's welcome uh, Girard. So I, I, I hand over Girard. Maybe a quick introduction about further about yourself, a bit about the um, the Malacca butterfly and reptile sanctuary. Okay. Then I'll put on the slides. All right. Thanks. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you for having uh, having me here, Mr. Buti. Okay. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. I can already see so many young lepidopterists there. Okay, my name is Gerard Wong. I am from uh, Malacca Butterfly Reptile Sanctuary. I'm the managing director here and the second generation managing the sanctuary. So um, just take a very quick uh, walk down the memory lane. Malacca Butterfly Reptile Sanctuary was uh, established and open to public on the 1st of uh, February 1991. It's almost 29 years. So back then we were known as Malacca Butterfly Park and only exhibiting uh, butterflies but not doing any breeding was over then. So 19, in 1996, we opened up our first butterfly breeding laboratory and it was around that time we changed our name to Malacca Butterfly and Reptiles and Breed. So at the moment, we are touching a, a breeding scale of close to 200,000 butterflies annually and we are the only center in the whole world mass breeding one of the largest butterfly in Malaysia, the tree neem butterfly, giant tree neem. Um, I'll talk about the giant tree neem butterfly shortly, but if you are keen to look at it, you can visit our website, click on the icon of a Malaysian giant tree neem, then you can discover the beauty of this butterfly. This is a butterfly that is for every Malaysian. Yeah, thanks, Kuti. Okay, um, do you want me to start correctly, uh, straight? So today's topic okay. is about starting your own butterfly garden. Yeah? Yes, go ahead. The... Go ahead. Are we, you see the screen already? Yeah, that's the topic, isn't it? Yes, yes, correct. So why not we talk about the significance of butterfly first? So, yeah. Hold on, um, uh, just having some problem the screen sharing. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So during this MCO, we try to create a lot of awareness on butterflies. And uh, one of the most common questions we encounter is, why do we have to breed butterflies? What are the significance of butterflies? So I think uh, asking this question is a hit at bull's eyes that a lot of people, I'm very surprised, even my friends, some of them are auditors, accountants and engineers, they ask me, Gerard, what, what is the importance of butterflies? Why should we care about them? Okay, um, the, the answer is fa fairly straightforward. Butterflies are pollinators. They're alongside with bees, um, some nectar-seeking birds, uh, uh, ants, moths, yeah, they are all part of the pollinators. And um, why are they important? Just uh, as a matter of fact, about 85 to 90% of plants requires a pollen uh, uh, to be distributed to bear fruits and uh, uh, seeds. So the moment butterfly disappear from the face of her, it will bring a lot of uh, negative consequences to the place that we are living now. So a quick comparison, butterflies and uh, bees. Okay. Well, bees tend to work in a very localized area. Butterflies travel a great distance. So covering an equal amount of uh, uh, butterflies, uh, host plant, sorry, the flowering plant in a larger area. So they are very active in the afternoon, flying all over and are visiting many different flowers in the wild. Um, as you may already know, <coughs> butterflies have very long purposes and their legs are farther than bees, so they are not really good in collecting pollen. And in fact, in fact, they are designed, the structures of butterfly bodies are not meant to carry pollen at all. Okay, but in the process of getting nectar, as they perch on the flower, and coil their proboscis deep into the flowers to extract the nectar, their bodies, their abdomen, their thorax, their pulse, their wings all come into contact with um, pollens. And as they 
is it from flowers to flowers they help to distribute the pollen so yeah it's very simple to to to, to uh, answer the question what is the importance of butterflies simply they are the important agent of uh, uh, pollination so that is uh, the first uh, important role of butterflies so we can go to the second slide um, Mr. Buti. So the second important uh, role of uh, butterflies, we can look at it in terms of our ecosystem. Many people, they miss this part. So uh, butterfly is very tiny. So why is it significant in our ecosystem? So this uh, photo, we have uh, uh, extracted it from our lava center. So if you have time, you probably have to come here and look at the, the whole uh, full picture. Here we are assuming um, the tree itself is a nectar plant and is a host plant for butterflies. So we are taking it for granted, okay? At the top left of the graphic, you have a butterfly there fluttering around and uh, taking some nectar from the flowering. Uh, and after that, it lays some eggs on the young and tender leaves. And these eggs will typically hatch within four to seven days. After that, the larva will come out and the, the only job for this larva is to eat and they feed and eat and eat growing several hundred times uh, bigger than its original size when it was hatched from the eggs so during the whole process they produce sprouts okay these are uh, little discharge will drop to the ground and acts as a fertilizer for the plant so the plant with this fertilizer will have fertilized root and while at the moment meanwhile the lava continue to grow so until the time when the larva is advanced enough, they change into chrysalis. By that time, fertilized root promote vigorous growth of the plant and they start to flower. So by the time the trees are, are, are blooming with flowers, the butterfly is closed from the chrysalis and butterfly came out and start uh, getting nectar from the plant. So from the flowers. So the flowers get pollinated and they start to bear fruits. So this is how butterfly works in the whole environment. And for every stage of uh, metamorphosis, the eggs, the larva, chrysalis, and butterflies, they are a source of very high and rich uh, protein for many different species of uh, insects. For the eggs, for example, the, the ants just can't go without the eggs uh, of butterflies during their party and or sanctuary. We really curse them. Um, uh, for the larva, some hornets like to eat them severe their skin, cut their flesh into chunks of meat and carry them back into their hive. Yeah, that's how it works. And same uh, goes with uh, chrysalis and butterflies uh, are the favorite food of uh, lizards and birds. And you'd be surprised, you know, and to find out actually squirrels like to eat butterflies. And uh, <clears throat> that's why we cannot be friends with uh, squirrels in our sanctuary. So if uh, butterflies were to go extinct, a lot of these uh, little small creatures will go hungry, you see. So that's uh, basically the two important role of butterflies. So put aside these two, one will just have to imagine our world without butterflies. Can you imagine a world without butterflies? There will be no butterflies on the painting, no butterflies on the video, and you will not dream butterflies. So simply our world will, will, will be reduced and strip off a lot of colors in our world. Yeah. Okay, next slide. I can only see Mr. Lee in my next slide. <laughs> okay, now we go to the metamorphosis. So butterfly go through complete metamorphosis. That means the moment they are hatched and the final outcome of the imago looks entirely different. Yeah, this is uh, the special thing about butterfly and we call it complete metamorphosis. So as I've already shown, there are four stages of uh, metamorphosis cycle for butterflies. They all started, all of them started from egg, then a couple of days changed larva and uh, into chrysalis and into the final butterflies, we call them mago. Yeah, by the way, chrysalis is a special term for the <coughs> pupa of a uh, uh, butterfly. So if you talk about pupa, it applies to uh, pupa of uh, many other insects. But if you talk about chrysalis, 
Okay, this strictly only refer to butterflies. So from now on, we will talk. Uh, we will refer butterfly pupa as chrysalis. Yeah. So this slide we are uh, we are showing the complete uh, metamorphosis cycle. As you can see, we have the eggs and then growing to larva before they grow uh, several hundred times bigger, and then to the chrysalis, and finally the adult imago butterfly. So if you were to compare the size of uh, larva when they are hatched from the egg until the time when they are ready to form chrysalis, it's just like us, the moment we uh, uh, come, out in, uh, come to this world as a baby, by the time we are ready to form chrysalis, we would have been the size, the rough, roughly the size of a, of, a, of a bus. So can you imagine, you have to eat that much to, 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 before they can change into chrysalis. That will slightly indicate to you how much leave they are going to take. And this is going to be very important if you're going to start breeding them later. So we will cover that topic in a short while. Okay, next slide. Okay, these are some of the eggs uh, <coughs> under the magnifying glass. This is by some 20 times uh, the original size. Um, you can see this in our lava center. So this is just a tip of the iceberg. And every um, family of butterflies, they have their eggs which look totally, entirely different from one another. So the first one, we have something that looks like watermelon. It's, uh, it's our leaf butterfly, the Indian leaf butterfly, we'll show you later. And the second one is a popular, uh, popular politis. It's the most common one that you can get. Those in the household, on the lime tree, lime butterfly, common mormon, great mormon, red highland, they all look alike. And the rest are more uh, exotic butterflies that we can see. And uh, I'd like to highlight one, one egg there, the white color one that looks like golf, the, the second, second one, the second one, uh, yeah, yeah, this one. So this, this is the, the egg for the Malaysian giant tree name. So the most famous butterfly in, in Malaysia now. Okay, so we will talk about it later. Yeah, the next slide. <clears throat> so the next cycle <clears throat> in the metamorphosis is the larvae. So larvae comes in all forms and all color. Um, <clears throat> actually, talk about the colors you can, whatever colors you can imagine, you can find on butterflies. They go yeah. Yellow, blue, metallic, green, white, black, all the color imaginable. Uh, uh, you can see them on uh, uh, butterflies. So the, the, the one in the middle, the red one, the red one is my favorite, is my favorite, is a Malaysian uh, lace wing. Uh, the common name, some people refer them to as a batik butterfly. Batik butterfly, so yeah, it can be uh, seen in our century. And the top one there, the, you can see the larvae, is uh, <coughs> preparing uh, to, to form chrysalis, the second one, yeah, to form chrysalis. Yeah, this is uh, just a short moment before it will form, uh, it will turn into chrysalis. Okay, butterfly world is full of discovery. So even ourselves, after 30 years of uh, uh, <coughs> discovery, we cannot have answer for every species. The first one on the left, the top left, the top left, yeah, is a Troides uh, family. But unfortunately, that larva never make it to the end. So we are unable to identify the exact species on what it will be when you become a butterfly. So the discovery route continue every day. Okay, so next slide. <coughs> ah, so after larva, when the larva had consumed enough of the host plant, it will start to form chrysalis. I can say the chrysalis also come in a number of forms and uh, <coughs> number of colors and you can even have gold. The one on the right is the giant tree name, uh, chrysalis, one that we have researched and, uh, and put on a discovery road for about 16 years before we can finally mass produce them. Okay, the one on the left, the first on the left, yeah, the bottom left, bottom left, yes. This is the chrysalis of uh, Mar uh, Malaysia orange tip. And as you can see, the chrysalis already becoming slightly transparent. You can see the wings inside orange color tip and the white wings. This is just a um, few hours before, uh, yeah, maybe seven, eight hours before the butterfly it closed. Yeah. Okay, so these are the chrysalis stage. And the next one. And of course, after the chrysalis, the butterfly will be closed and turn into butterflies. Yeah, the next one. 
sorry just uh, hold on uh, it's uh, Yeah, so the moment this butterfly come out from the chrysalis, it doesn't look as beautiful as this. They come out and look like a creeper form of wings and they will start pumping the fluid from the abdomen through the veins into the wings and just like how you open up the umbrella, they will expand the wings and it will take a few hours uh, before the wing get dry and hardened and before they can really take off and start fluttering. And it is usually, usually in the morning that a butterfly come out from the chrysalis. And at this moment, the sun just rise and the, the flowers are just producing nectar and full of nectar. And as the wing get hardened and they take off and start searching for nectar, they, the flowers are inviting them for the breakfast. This is how magical nature is. Okay? So the moment they start to break the door from the chrysalis, they are fighting against time. If they get stuck in the chrysalis and after a few moments never manage to get out or never manage to pump the fluid and expand the wings, that wings will dry and become the permanent form of uh, uh, the butterflies. The butterflies can't fly and it will die. Right? Next one. Okay. <clears throat> so that's basically um, about butterflies, the importance and the um, the metamorpho metamorphosis cycle they go through. So the next one we will have to answer how to start a butterfly garden. Okay, this is an important topic. How to start a butterfly garden? This is the question we have been asking ourselves for 30 years. <laughs> so um, there's a, not a straight cut question, but of course here we are referring to a backyard butterfly garden, one that um, is without the structure holding the butterflies inside. So the butterflies can come in as they like and fly away as they like. In order to start a butterfly garden, you will have to understand the difference, the differences between butterfly nectar plant and butterfly host plant. So yeah, I don't want to make it very complicated, but you do have to understand the difference between host plant and nectar plant. So for nectar plant, we use nectar plant to attract many species of butterflies, not all, not all, but many species of butterflies, but you use host plant to target a specific species or specific number of species of butterflies for breeding purposes. So the, the function of these plants are different. So finding the nectar plants are much easier and locating the host plant is a very difficult job. And we have been spending all these 20, 30 years trying to locate the host plants for many species of butterfly. And we found ourselves um, um, trapped sometimes uh, and have to consistently play in the hide and seek game imposed by nature to identify the host plant. Okay, <coughs> can we have the next slide? Yeah, hold on, it's, it's always freezing up, I don't know why. Okay, um, just how you want to start a butterfly garden. To do it, you must understand how butterfly locate its nectar. So butterfly is blessed with ultraviolet vision with it, the flowers all looks very imminent, very different and, uh, uh, to the butterfly's vision. And it's basically glowing under the eyes of butterflies. So these ultraviolet visions are good in uh, locating uh, red color and deep pink. So that basically gives you a clue on the type of flowers, the colors of flowers that you should have in your garden. Red is good, uh, pink is good, um, white, um, not so good because white under the, the vision of butterflies will seems like a big bug uh, in front of your eyes. So it's glowing. So we try to avoid white color for butterflies. Okay? Um, of course, uh, butterflies are also blessed with uh, uh, the, the uh, scent, sense, uh, scent receptors on their legs, on their pups and uh, uh, proboscis. So they don't just depend on the vision, they also have nose 
care to find out where their food are, right? So before you go into butterfly garden, you will just, maybe you will have to question how much, how much nectar, or how much plants, how much flowers do you have in your butterflies, uh, for your butterflies in your backyard. Um, we, we have done a research some 10 years ago on Tropanoptera brookiana, our national butterfly, national butterfly, Raja Brook. So we uncoiled the proboscis of these uh, national butterflies and put it into our artificial nectar. And we see every time it suck the nectar up through its proboscis, the amount, the volume of nectar it taken is roughly that produced by 100 uh, hibiscus. Yeah, for one butterfly. So can you imagine? Yeah, so how do we cope with thousands of butterflies in our aviary? Do we change the nectar plant every day? No, no. Okay, here's another thing for you to know. But, uh, flowers only produces nectar very tiny amount of nectar once every day and usually it's in the morning so they produce once and the customers which is butterfly butterfly come and take the nectar and the next customers come there won't be any for them so it's strictly on a first come first serve basis so in our aviary we cannot afford to change the the, the plants every moment so we are providing them with artificial nectar. So you want to do an artificial nectar, it's very easy. Just use a sugar, dilute them in water, about 10% strength, then you can provide it to your butterflies. Yeah, of course, maybe you don't need it in your backyard garden. Um, we take a look at the nectar bearing plants. So I've selected so many here. So hibiscus are typically good for bigger butterflies. If you see bigger butterflies in your area, um, try this, uh, bird wings, uh, great mormon, the bigger species, they are all good with hibiscus. Hibiscus is uh, uh, very loaded with nectar. So we have the Isora. Isora don't take the smaller one. Isora, you have to take those uh, bigger uh, flowers, Isora. The small one typically used for fencing purposes are not good enough. So the big Isora is so orange. The red one is especially good. Um, Duranta is uh, my favorite. Duranta is especially good for common uh, household butterflies, the small, the white apias. And uh, Pentas is good for basically the big and small butterflies. Marigold for the smaller butterflies. Lantana for smaller butterflies. Shooting Star is my favorite plant. Uh, Shooting Star is uh, kind of hard to get at this moment. And the Hawaii Heater is a common plant for smaller uh, species of uh, butterfly. Yeah, with this plant at your backyard, you will be able to see some butterflies. Um, by sharing with you just now the amount of uh, nectar needed by a butterfly, that basically gives you a hint on why is the number of butterflies in, uh, in the world now is uh, decreasing very quickly, simply because there isn't, any, uh, there isn't enough uh, nectar plant for all these butterflies. Just imagine one butterfly will need 100 uh, hibiscus to produce a nectar for it. If you have 1,000 butterflies, you multiply that by 100, and uh, the mathematics uh, is, is a big, produces a big number there. So, of course, deforestation also play a big part where the host plant all uh, uh, are decreasing at a very alarming rate. So, yeah, butterfly uh, density is very low at the moment. So, with your backyard garden, um, you, you will see butterflies, but you kind of be like, um, not going to be very happy if you are expecting hundreds of them in your garden. It doesn't work that way with a, with a open garden for butterflies. Yeah. So yeah, you can see some of them uh, coming, but not in the thousands or hundreds. Okay. This is a macro factor. Okay. Yeah, like I said, butterfly population is very low. Do not expect to see hundreds of them in your garden. Okay. Um, and not all butterflies are attracted to flowers. Some of them, they just like the minerals on, on, the, on the sand. Uh, they are after the sodium content there. And you have to take, uh, take note of this. Many flowers are actually attractive 
but do not produce any nectar. So these flowers are not useful for butterfly garden, for your backyard butterfly garden, things like bougainvillea. Bougainvillea are extremely beautiful and uh, flowering forever, but they don't produce any nectar for, for butterflies. And butterflies show no interest on them. The sunflower, sunflowers are good for bees, but are not good for butterflies. Olander, Olander, Olander um, is not a, a nectar bearing plant, but it's a host plant for a species of butterfly there. Um, okay. Right, now we go for butterfly breeding. So that's so much so for butterfly garden. Basically for butterfly garden, all you need to do is just transform your garden into a rich uh, nectar bearing plants garden. Yeah. So for butterfly breeding, is a very entirely different topic. It's a fairly technical, and we have to say you cannot be a lepidopterist breeding butterflies without first being a horticulturist, because many butterfly host plants are actually very fussy. So if you are not blessed with your green fingers, you might fail many many times before eventually uh, uh, made it. Okay, and for us, the commercial breeding requires a big areas of host plant planting. Yeah, here in our sanctuary, uh, our exhibition area is about three acres and our plantation is about seven acres. This just basically give you a view on how much plants we need to support the uh, butterfly populations of about 200,000 annually. Okay, and uh, it is very demanding work and you cannot apply pesticide with your plants and um, yeah, no fungicide should be used. And younger butterfly larvae, they need very young tender leaf. So to grow one, one species of butterfly, you, for one larvae, you, might have, you may have to have many host plants simply because you want to provide them a different stage of leaf and different stages of the larva's uh, uh, metamorphosis. Okay, so the young one will take the young leaf, so as they grow, they will take the older leaf and become oldest before forming chrysalis. They need a mature leaf. So you have to ensure you have the different stages of the leaf of that host plant before you can really start uh, keeping butterflies. And um, one thing which is not very nice for the butterfly host plant is they don't always look beautiful. See, many, many butterfly host plants do not bear flowers. They are creepers that are not very beautiful for our house but are important okay so these are uh, some of the uh, i prepared some a few species of butterflies that you might encounter and keep at home the first one is not a butterfly it's a moth it's one of the largest moth in the world and the largest in malaysia uh, it's an atlas moth of the scientific name atacus alas the reason of uh, choosing this uh, larvae for you is um, because the host plants are generally easily uh, uh, obtained. So they feed on a few species of host plant. You can go on citrus, you can go on uh, sour soap, you can have uh, them feeding on rambutan leaf. Yeah, it's fairly common. Those host plants are fairly common. <clears throat> but they are giant eaters. So you have to make sure that you have uh, a lot of these host plant. Uh, standing by before you go into them. Um, the problem is maybe you don't always see this uh, this moth, and uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, go to the second uh, slide. So this is the beginner beginner species of uh, butterfly that appears in uh, or strip albatross. The host plant is a uh, uh, rhodostoma. It's also very common. I'm sure if you start walking around uh, your backyard, you will see this plant with this uh, purple color flowers. And uh, uh, looking closely, you can identify the egg, which are very small and orangey egg. And you can collect them. It's a very good species for beginners and, and easily available. You can find it uh, in your backyard. This butterfly is common everywhere you can see. Okay, next one. Ah. For those of you who want to have a bigger tree in your house, you can consider the cinnamon, uh, uh, cinnamon tree. Yeah, cinnamon tree. So uh, this tree produces two uh, butterflies. One is the common mine, 
and the other one is a blue bottle butterfly on the right. The blue butterfly, a blue blue bottle butterfly is on the right. The one with the green, and the common mind is on the left. On the left, as you can see, I already put in there the common mind eggs uh, is a uh, red color. It's very very small. It's red color, and its chrysalis will look exactly like a dead branch. Can you see that? So you contrast that with a blue bottle. You can see blue bottle on the top right. It's green color. Top right, yes. So both of them you can find on your cinnamon tree. So and um, almost never fail. If you have a cinnamon tree in your house and uh, you want to attract this butterfly to, to your tree, just trim them down as the young leaf grows, just like the one in the graphic, the young red color tender leaf comes up, you will for sure see some cinnamon, uh, see some common mind or blue bottle larvae there. Yeah, it is a rewarding species. Okay, the, the next one is a popular, uh, a popular species, a very common species, the common momon. Common momon, the one in the middle is a, is a black one, is male, very common momon. And the one in the middle left is the female, they are polymorphic. Okay, so these are very common butterflies. And the one on the top, on the top, uh, middle top, yeah, the one is an orange color version, is a, is a mutated version uh, bred in our laboratory. There's a evolution theory behind the color of this butterfly. So we put out an article about 30 pages on this evolution theory. So that happened because of a, a population density that we have. So in the wild, it's kind of uh, difficult to have this more. Okay. So this species is very common. If you have uh, any rutasia uh, species of plant in your house, like the lime, the curry, curry tree, we used to cook curry. Yeah, this is a wild curry. <coughs> okay, and you will probably have this um, common momon. So the one on the left, the, the picture on the left shows how the, the chrysalis looks like on the top. And at the bottom is how the Um, love looks like okay. Popular kids, yeah. This one. Uh, the next one. <clears throat> yeah, same goes back to the Rutasia family. So the next slide, please. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, if you have pomelo tree and uh, uh this slide, just one, just one, yeah. If you have pomelo tree, curry tree, or lime tree, you depends on the locality of your, your area. You might uh, have this uh, lime butterfly, the one on the left, lime butterfly. Yes, yes, that's a lava. The lime butterfly, the one on the top is a female. Uh, the one at the bottom is a male. Lime butterfly is extremely beautiful, creamy color, yellowish, and a little bit of orange and red there. It's one of my favorite butterflies. It's a colorful butterfly that everyone should get. Um, and uh, this plant, the, the citrus maxima or the pomelo leaf or the, the lime tree, they are very powerful host plant, not just for common momon, for lime butterfly, but for other bigger species like the great momon, great momon, the one at the top, yeah, middle top, the great momon is one of the biggest butterfly in Malaysia, it's quite common. If uh, you have a pomelo tree in your house, I'm not surprised you will visit it, uh, provided you don't spray pesticide on it, yeah. And um, the one in the middle, the red highland, is also uh, uh, as big as a great momon, just slightly smaller. And the one at the top, uh, at the bottom right, is a black and white highland. So this highland are uh, uh, some of the most uh, magnificent and biggest butterflies in Malaysia. And their, their larvae looks quite identical to layman's eyes. When you look at it uh, uh, in the picture, it looks quite identical, but in fact, they are very, very different from, uh, from the moment they hatch and right through the moment they form in the crystallis, it looks different. If you have any of them and you want to ID them, feel free to contact us or send a picture here. And uh, uh, yeah, we will try to ID them for you. Okay. Uh, one clue here, one clue here. If you, if you have one of these larvae and you start to feed them with your curry leaf, they they will stick to curry leaf. 
So if you run out of kali leaf and you try to put them on the citrus plant, they will not eat and they will die. So stick to one type of leaf throughout the life cycle, okay? Ah, this is another very common one that, that looks like a leaf. Um, the autumn leaf butterflies and the host plant is very common. Uh, the host plant, it can be found, uh, Acetasia is everywhere in Malaysia. Um, being common is also a big problem because if it's too common, it's kind of hard for you to locate the egg of this butterfly. So you will have to basically explore your backyard. And uh, if you can see the butterflies lying there, chances are you can find the eggs there. And try to look at the tips of this uh, leaf, okay? Usually the very young one. And uh, if you turn the leaf around, usually lay eggs at the bottom of the leaf. If you turn them around and see a few white color marble like uh, eggs, uh, they are probably the eggs of these butterflies, okay? The, the chrysalis is at the top right. So it's brown color, not very striking. So if we, if we uh, uh, form the chrysalis uh, around this host plant, probably you cannot see them. Okay, you have to pay attention to locate them. Okay, next one. Ah, this is uh, one of the very beautiful butterfly, the, the graphium or KJ. And the host plant is uh, the tall and a uh, big uh, Ahsoka. And you can find usually in the government center, uh, schools. And uh, I think I've been to Seremban in a couple of areas. I've seen that in Seremban near the, the stadium. And when you go there and look at the young leaves, usually you can find the larva at the top left. It looks like the, the chocolate, small chocolate on the top left. That's how they look like when they are in the first few insects. And as they grow and develop into advanced stage at the uh, right bottom left, they change into green larva and before finally become a chrysalis. Yeah, chrysalis, yes. Okay. So this is a uh, Graphium agamemnon. Right. Okay, these uh, are some of other exotic uh, species. Uh, exotic, I mean Malaysian exotic species, which is very rare. So these are some of the successful story uh, the century uh, produced. This is the Apio, uh, Apio funera syncrax, white head wings. One of my favorite, it's very difficult to breed because the plants is uh, very hard to encounter. Uh, we have been uh, successful with this species some two years ago, and now um, the host plant planting uh, is in progress uh, before we can mass produce them. So we we'll go to the next one. Ah, so this is uh, the giant trinim butterfly that uh, I talked about in the beginning. Giant trinim butterfly is, um, <coughs> is our Malaysian butterfly. So it's, uh, it can be found here, native to Malaysia. Uh, um, our border, Thailand, and uh, northern area of uh, Indonesia. So these butterflies, just like any other, is beautiful right from the beginning. From the moment, the eggs are, the eggs are extremely beautiful to the lava, the, the inviting color of lavas of red, white, and black. And to the moment they form chrysalis, it's a rainbow, a, a zebra stripe, chrysalis, and after half an hour to one hour, it changed into gold. This is a scenario where we say gold grows on tree. Only the gold never lasts a long time. So about uh, some 12 days later, they will come out, they close and become one of the most beautiful butterflies, one of the biggest. And uh, on the top left there, you can see the, the pairs are mating. Here we are, we, we hand pet them. We usually don't hand pet butterflies only when under very extreme circumstances, when our breeding pairs are reducing very quickly and refuse to mate, we hand pet them. So kids don't do that at home. It requires a lot of skills to do that. If you hand pet them wrongly, you will kill them. Okay, so this is the giant training butterfly um, that uh, every Malaysian should be proud of. If you really like the story, go to our website and read it and see how difficult it was throughout our 16 years of discovery producing this butterfly. Okay, next slide. Okay, these are some of the other animals that you can see uh, in our sanctuary. I was asked by Mr. Muti to, to brief uh, ladies and gentlemen here on the rough guide on what we can see here. We have the largest anacona in Malaysia at the moment. Our female, the top left, yeah, the top left, 
our female is close to 17 feet at the moment and, uh, uh, and possibly is expecting, we are hoping a good news from them, uh, uh, from the couple, yes. In the middle, we have the longest venomous snake in, uh, in, uh, in the world, the king cobra, you can see them. We have two very, very big senior king cobras here. And you can see the longest um, python in Malaysia. Uh, in fact, it's the longest snake in the world other than the anaconda. And also, uh, we have many species of uh, insects. We have the longest snake insect. We have the heaviest and biggest uh, tree horn rhinoceros beetle. We have the largest catadid. You don't have to travel to Singapore or San Diego Zoo to see the catadid when, in fact, they are from Malaysia. They are surprised me. A lot of people go to San Diego Zoo and take the, the picture of a giant candidate and come back to show me, hey, Gerard, see what I've got there in San Diego Zoo. I told them, hey, this is from, from Malaysia. So you better come and visit our sanctuary after the lockdown, okay? Right, the next one. Oh yeah, in the middle, we have the uh, American alligator. Yeah, you don't have to travel to America to see American alligator. We have one, uh, one pair here. It's the only pair in the whole of Malaysia. They are about 28 years old at the moment. Okay, next one. Ah, so these are the Philippine sailfin on the right. Uh, you don't have to go to the Philippines to look at the sailfin lizard. And we have the blue iguana on the left and many species of birds also in the sanctuary. So really, we are not just butterfly. That's why we call ourselves butterfly and reptile sanctuary. So all these are under the reptile care. Yeah? So next one. <clears throat> Ah, so about uh, COVID-19, we, um, COVID-19 had really brought about the most uh, disheartening moment here because our team, our team was torn apart. Our laboratory staff were locked down, disabling them from carrying thousands of lavas in our lab. So as a country embroiled in this serious battle with COVID-19, the sanctuary only source of income was lost. And um, <clears throat> with negative income and staff reduced to skeleton workforce, the eggs are not properly taken care of, our laboratories operation paralyzed, our whole plant are, are getting dry very fast. Um, and it was very sad as the situation become increasingly, became increasingly dire, we were forced to actually utilize more than a few thousands of larvae. It was the darkest moment in our sanctuary from the date of our, our inception. And um, tears fill all of our staff's eyes. Yeah, no words can express our sorrow here. So, um, which is why at the moment we are running this donation adoption program. So what you can do is um, um, uh, adopt and we have offered our precious chrysalis. Like this one shown on the screen, you can also see here, uh, if you adopt our chrysalis, you will receive a package. And once you open it, you can see the chrysalis inside. And take out the chrysalis. Yeah, take out the chrysalis. And uh, open it and put it inside the jar. Then you are all set to wait for the chrysalis to turn into butterfly. Next slide, please. Yeah, that's how you will have the chrysalis. Once you put an attachment onto the string, yeah, it's a very simple thing to do. We already pin it for you. Just take it out and pin on the string. We already tie a knot for your convenience. And put it back. Cover the lid and you are all set to witness the most beautiful transformation of chrysalis into butterflies. Uh, the instruction will be included in the package. Yeah? So if you need more information, again, visit our website at www.butterflyreptile.com. So fly along with us and support conservation, support Malacca Butterfly and Reptile Sanctuary. Yeah, you see? Yeah, I finished my slide. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much, Gerard, for that. I uh, um, hope it's not too dry. Yeah, we will get some feedback from, from our audience where on, on whether it's too dry or too wet, all right? <laughs> okay, so... Um, anyway, yes. anyway, Mr. Bhutti, 
Malaysia has more than a thousand species of butterflies. So uh, what we can, what I've just briefed here is just the tip of the iceberg. So if you need more information, just call us. Yeah. Yes, yes, correct. And the website, where's the website again? Um, Could, could you read out the website again for, for our audience? Uh, www.butterflyreptile.com Butterflyreptile.com Okay, okay, thank you. So uh, yes, uh, um, yeah. a, a lot of... You can also go to Ticket to You to just in case you want to place your order there. Uh, if you are a member to Ticket to You, you can anytime place your order there. Okay, okay, yeah. thank you. So... A lot of information sharing in such a short time, and yeah, uh, yeah. it's it's really yeah, it's a lot. kind of stressful for me to, to squeeze everything into one. <laughs> no, it's okay. I think at least people have the the basic information, like the the life cycle of the butterfly. What is its main purpose? Uh, what are the flowers that are needed? Oh. Wow! To to feed a butterfly, you need one hundred hibiscus flower. Ah, that's exactly how, that, how that is a lot. And, Everybody uh, start uh, will have to start planting flowers if you really like butterflies. Yes, yes, I think we need to do that. But you mentioned that uh, we can do artificial nectar. That mean yeah. that means if we put sugar water outside, yeah, they will ten percent sugar strength. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. you just have to melt the sugar, yeah, in uh, uh, in a concentrate manner and put. It inside before you add in some water about 10% strength uh, that's good for butterflies already but 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 you cannot keep the solution for for over two three days yeah because the risk of uh, uh, recrystallizing within butterfly is very high so you use it once and the next day you have to do it again okay okay, okay. so we um, open up the floor for questioning uh, for questions um, Leland Ping, where are you? Yeah, yes. yeah, I'm here. Uh, I turned off my video. Uh, Maybe we okay. can take um, uh, uh, in interest of time. We can take three questions, and then the rest we can answer them on Facebook. Is that okay? Yeah, why not? Okay. Uh, there's there's some question like uh, what's how do different differentiate? Uh, I mean butterfly and moth. Uh, and what's uh, the difference between butterfly larvae, larvae and moth larvae? Okay. Okay. The difference between butterfly and moth, uh, we can say generally butterflies are very active in the noon, while moth uh, don't really fly around. Maybe they, they, they're more active in the night. Okay, they have a very different antenna also. The moth one will have an antenna that looks something like the coconut leaf and uh, for butterflies generally they have a very fine antenna long fine antenna and um, uh, the larvae and larvae what's the difference between larvae of moth and larvae of uh, butterflies they look entirely different <laughs> they look entirely different so uh, in order to identify the difference between the larvae of uh, uh, butterfly and moth you will have to be exposed to them yeah, be exposed to them. In fact, you will have to be exposed to all the different species of butterflies larvae to identify this larva belongs to this butterfly and this one belongs to this moth. Okay, and uh, for moth, we have um, more than 160, 160,000 species of moth in Malaysia. There is no way that uh, in, in the world, so there is no way you can identify all of them and tell them this is moth and this is larva, okay? But basically for moth, for moth, uh, what, what I used to do when I was a kid, for moth larva, usually they move fairly quickly compared to, to butterfly larva. And if you use your tip of finger and touch on the, the caps on the head, the moth larva can go on the reverse gear backward. The butterfly larva hasn't got that in their, in their system. They just can't move backward, you see. So there's a quick try for you to see whether they are lava or, or, or butterfly or moth. But um, to, to know it for sure, take down the picture, send an email to us, and our team will be sure and more than happy to help you with the idea. Okay? Okay. Uh, there's another question. Uh, the, the both question just now is from Angel Chai. 
And this, this, there's a question here. Anna Khalid said, uh, what's your opinion on invasive, invasiveness of butterfly and moth? I think. Invasive, invasive. Invasive, yes. Okay. Um, the, there's a big topic. I can say butterfly, I, I, I did mention butterfly density is all time low. They are disappearing. So, uh, I can't see the, the invasiveness of butterfly yet because they are disappearing. And I, I, I can tell you in about 30 years time, based on my experience and based on, on my observation in the wild where these most plants are, many species of butterfly will be extinct in Malaysia. So you, you must... Oops. Would you mute yourself? It works. Because, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah? Me so, um, uh, I was saying uh, the, the question of uh, invasiveness is uh, totally out of question because butterflies are simply disappearing. There are not enough of them now. They are getting lesser. The host plants are getting reduced. And in about 30 years time, many species of butterfly will go into the endangered list. Okay, so while, while we're waiting for him, while we're waiting for him to come back, I just do a quick poll if you, um, if you all don't mind, just um, if I can find the poll. Of, uh, uh, if you talk about invasiveness of a uh, forming, you hear me? Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, okay, start, start again. It's too hot of a topic. Okay, we understand yeah. uh, that the, the spoon cannot handle the are, topic. I was just uh, saying the population density of butterflies we see today is nowhere to to, to compare to, to the one that we have seen some 30 years ago. Butterflies are getting very, very, very little now. So it's not going to be invasive anyhow, see? It's just getting lesser and lesser, and in about 30 years' time, many of them will be classified into the endangered species. Mark my words. Yeah. Maybe I can have a follow-up question on that. In that situation, how would that affect our food supply, fruits and so yeah. on? You know? Luckily, butterflies are not just the only pollinator in the team. Say we still have other players, the bees, the bats, um, the nectar seeking uh, birds, the ants, the moth, the moth, yeah, they are also a good pollinator. But um, as we butterflies, we, which is uh, facing tremendous pressure from human industrialization, the other team players are also having the same problem. Particularly now, the bees are having a lot of problems. Bees are professionals. Everywhere in the world are complaining that bees are dying uh, due to pesticides or fungicides being applied on the flowers and plants. So we are doing a very big negative impact onto ourselves. Yeah. If uh, maybe uh, limping, maybe one more to follow up. Um, will it be helpful if, I mean, our participants here, you know, they, they start to, to um, have flowers that are receptive, that are able to support the butterfly population, host plants. Will that make a difference or it doesn't really make a difference? Mm. More, more nectar bearing plants will allow more butterflies to, to feed. And when they are, they are not hungry, they can concentrate on breeding. So when they breed, yeah, <laughs> that's how it works. When they breed, then you will have more eggs and more larvas. Of course, then you have to complement that with um, the uh, uh, increased number of host plants in the wild. And basically all these host plants are now in the forest, in the Malaysian forest. And the way it is uh, opening up the forest is uh, uh, it's very frightening to see. So many years ago, when we look at the uh, host plant for Malaysian giant tree name, it's widely available in Para and Pahang. And a few years ago, when we go back and look at the area where these host plants are found, it's already been turned into strawberry farm and uh, some with pineapples and, and some with high-rise buildings and houses. 
So, which is why the only way of keeping these butterflies uh, alive is by having the host plant here in our sanctuary. So we have about uh, 50 species of the host plant, good enough for more than uh, uh, 60 species of butterflies here and for the uh, Malaysian giant training. So this is the only way, this is the only way we can ensure these rare butterflies continue to fly, continue to roam in Malaysia and forever. Yeah. Okay, uh, Len Ping, I think we can uh, wrap it up. Is it okay? Yeah. The other questions uh, we can look at it yeah. uh, and then post on Facebook. Uh, just to wrap up, I would like to thank uh, Girard thank you. for giving his, his time <laughs> and also for to all our participants. And uh, yeah, we, we can do, we can actually can help uh, him and his team to continue uh, to breed the butterflies, um, especially in Malacca. And uh, to do that, we can do the adoption. We, if you are able to, let us help to adopt a butterfly, uh, a, a, a chrysalis, or or more. All right. So I will put up the information in the uh, WhatsApp group that we have temporarily. Also in the Facebook, the the adoption program, and uh, you can always uh, and the website as well is, is is available on the website. So you can always uh, contact the, um, the sanctuary for that information and then uh, see if you can um, do a little bit for the butterfly. So I think uh, time is up and we thank you and we look forward to uh, seeing you again at the next talk. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much for having me. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye.